Hello again, my name is Adi Dunyodunfa and it's my pleasure to be with you again. Today we'll be addressing, discussing another very interesting subject. I've got a very exciting speaker to join me on this program today. We'll be talking about a little understood, an emerging and undeniable phenomenon, which has been termed by some as the touch screen generation. If you don't know what I'm talking about, obviously you're not part of that generation. But somebody who is indeed a part of that generation, maybe not so much in age, but in, in, in mind and in outlook, is my guest today. Before I introduce my speaker, a few words about this whole touchscreen generation and its implication on Africa. Africa today has the unfortunate burden of being at the bottom of most kind of indicators that are undertaken by international parties, whether it's the Knowledge Economy Index by the World Bank, or whether it's the, the Economic Intelligence Unit, e government payment adoption rate rankings, whatever it is, you'll find that most African nations are at the bottom. As more, even more sadly is the fact that the improvement that has been noted maybe over the last decade has been minimal even on those indicators. So what kind of picture does that paint for Africa on the one hand? On the other hand, Africa's greatest strength is undeniably its youth. We've got in Nigeria, for example, 70% of, of our population within the ages of 18 to 35. That's a lot of people. In Africa, generally, it's a similar trend. Now, these youth, these younger people, are people who have got grown up in the generation of mobile phones and social media. All these things are second nature to them. They've grown up with a completely different outlook. What does this mean to us today? What does this mean to us in the future? Our guest today is going to be giving us his perspective on, on this. Our guest is uh, somebody who has spent about 30 years in the field of ICT across different nations, involving himself and engaging different stakeholders and different communities, all for the purpose of bringing value. He's, he's worked across the US, the UK, Africa, and indeed some Asian countries, from startups to multinational companies, um, in different roles as chief operating officer, CEO, and the likes. So he's won many hats in the past. Today, he's wearing a different hat. And I'd like to welcome our guest for today, Mr. Tommy Davis. Thank you, Dre. Thank you, TD. Thank you for joining us today. Wow. Thank you for finding time out of your very busy schedule to yeah. join us. Thank you. I'm going to start by asking you a very simple question. As I said, the indicators paint a dismal picture. Mm. And we, we've come to be acquainted with a term called the digital divide. What role do you see for Africa as this digital divide continues to broaden? What, what is your own view of how Africa can address this challenge, especially with relation to the youths? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, when you look at the statistics, some of which you laid out, I think therein, where there is the problem, the flip side of that coin is also the solution. Mm. The fact that uh, this is a generation that has grown up on the mobile phone, um, it gives an edge because uh, when you look at the West, they've had to go transit from desktop to laptop, from laptop to tablet, you know, and mobility, the concept of always on, is not something that has just happened. Mm. Um, it's something they're getting used to. However, if you look at Africa, that's always been the situation because we didn't have the infrastructure. We've we have to have that situation of mobility. So power has created the need for having a mobile phone that has six hours battery life or long battery life. Mm. Um, the fact that we didn't have fixed line phones has meant that, you know, we have mobile phones instead. And fortunately for us, as we, we didn't get mobile phones when everybody else started, by the time it came, we are in this cusp of feature phone to smartphone, mm. giving us the touch screen capability. When you combine these with a very fertile imagination of a youthful population, you start to get 
into the creative elements we're seeing. The rise of Nollywood, the music industry, and the techpreneur, you know, uh, enterprising techpreneurs that we are starting to see across the continent. Interesting. So really, how does, how does Africa, what role does it play in this emerging digital economy? You know, what role do you see these youths, this teeming population of youths playing in the economy in Africa and globally? Well, um, there's a role I'm hoping we play. And I think that's what I'd sort of like to put out there. Um, we've done, like I said, Nollywood, which is film. We've done the music industry. And what that proves is, if you take our creative genius, mm. and that's always been there. If you look at art ar across the world, if you look at music across the world, mm. Africa has always influenced the world. Mm. What I'm working on and I'm hoping happens is that we learn how to develop content. Mm. Specifically, we learn how to code, mm. and software becomes the domain that we own. Okay. Why is that? It is because that is what requires intellectual capacity as opposed to physical infrastructure. Right. So since we're lagging behind already in infrastructure, mm -hmm. if we leapfrog and decide that we're going to focus our efforts on what we are already rich in, mm. then I see us not just participating, but actually leading the mm. world. Okay, that's interesting. So we take the creativity yeah. that you say is in it, in mm -hmm. the African youth, that's and correct. we combine that with some kind of basic technology. That's correct. And that you don't leash the, the software techpreneurs. That's correct. What role are you playing in this space currently? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think somebody asked me that and I said, the role I play is I'm the futurist node in the <laughs> network. Break that down for us, <laughs> for our viewers. <laughs> so my, my job, as I see it, is to challenge, hmm. okay, the youth to be better, okay, to do more with less in terms of technology. It is to challenge my Western friends and my Western network to support and provide what we don't have. And it is to challenge those who are of my generation mm. um, also to provide the platforms, okay, and the capacity that the youth will require. So that's why I call myself the Futurist Node. Interesting, Futurist Node, I'll remember that. Thank you. We probably have a few techpreneurs yeah. or budding techpreneurs watching us as we speak. Mm -hmm. What concrete initiatives today in Nigeria, in mm -hmm. other African nations, can they tap into to explore that potential? Okay, um, that's one I'm quite passionate about. Um, I think for me, um, we need to look at local problems that have scalable solutions. So when you look across the continent, we do have a plethora mm. of issues around education, mm. the ability for people to learn and learn quickly and learn deeply. And technology provides that opportunity. So addressing those learning opportunities mm. with accessible information and knowledge will provide one you know, set of activities that can generate, that can be commercialized in phenomenal ways. Okay. Um, if you look, for example, at what Joberman has done, okay, in the PR, uh, sorry, in the uh, HR and recruitment space, you start to get what I'm saying. They've mm. taken a paper-laced old boys network environment mm. and they have wrapped technology content around it. Mm. And all of a sudden, we're starting to see employment mm. um, raise uh, in ways we, we couldn't imagine before. Mm. So that, that's one aspect of it. If you look at health, um, we have an increasingly youthful population compared to the West and Asia where they have an increasingly mm. aging population. Mm. That means the kind of demo demographic answers that will be coming out of those will not necessarily be applicable within the African context. Mm. So I see that again as another area of opportunity that techpreneurs can start to address. So global positioning systems are giving us the ability to track people. Wearable computing is giving us the ability for people to actually carry computers with them, whether it's on their eyes, on their wrist, on their head, on their body, mm -hmm. what that means is from a health standpoint, we're gonna be able to do amazing things. Mm. 
mm. in terms of helping people with uh, disabilities. Mm. So Education and health, two key areas. Two fantastic areas. Of course, taking for granted the fact that we've done entertainment to death and we'll continue to do, the, do that. Mm. Transportation and all the others that are pretty much standard. I looked uniquely within the African context, where can we innovate and scale out to the rest of the world? Okay. Traditionally, over the, over the years, there mm -hmm. hasn't been much confidence in software that's been developed locally, mm -hmm. whether within Nigeria or within other African countries. And so we've seen what we would probably term as the rise and fall of the software industry. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying to us is that you think that there will be another emergence. Um, one of the things that could be really important is to be able to adhere to globally accepted global standards, mm -hmm. best practice standards. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you see happening? Are these techpreneurs aware that these standards exist? Because it should, it should enhance the acceptability of their products. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's funny you say that because that's where I'm actively playing at this very minute is addressing that particular problem because we looked at the last three years and we found something very interesting. Our techpreneurs were winning innovation prizes across the globe mm. for their ideas, mm. but when it came to scaling their software, mm. they fell. Mm. Why was that? We started, you know, we analyzed, I think, something like about 55 or 50, something, about 50 odd, you know, prize winners, techpreneurs from the continent and what it was um, that had led them not to be able to do what Spotify is doing in uh, Silicon Valley. And it was very, very simple. The ideas were sound. The market existed, but the ability for the software in its original form to scale mm. was lacking. Mm. And that was a fundamental issue with the technical competence and capability of the team. Mm. So people like Jon Lysurgeon, who is running the Meltwater Entrepreneurial School of Technology in Accra, um, Raymond Akule, who's running the Digital Bridge Institute um, in, out of Abuja, myself and a few others have decided that we are actually going to start looking at the creation of one or more software mm -hmm. academies. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. that will be placed locally and will address, uh, will take the students to the level where they can address things to international and scalable standards. Does government play a role in all of this? You know my view on government. <laughs> okay, I believe government should stick to its knittings. Government mm. needs to be an, a very good regulator mm. and give policy directives and then leave the rest to us. Mm. And um, that is where I believe government can play a very, very distinct role, is to provide the enhancements in terms of an enable, enabling environment that we can all work in. How well do you think we're playing this role, or they are playing this role currently? Um, I have to laud the Nigerian government in creating the Ministry of Communications Technology, Technology. but probably even more importantly, for selecting the minister we currently have, because she's just amazing. You know, um, I believe she's not without the challenges that are inherent in any bureaucratic uh, environment, but when you, by and large, when you look at what's been accomplished with the broadband policy, as a clear example, um, if we can accelerate those kind of activities, then yeah, we are moving in the right direction. Let's, let's just come back to the techpreneurs. How do you mm -hmm. connect with them currently? Oh, how do I connect? I, I operate and collaborate quite a number of platforms. So I act as an advisor um, to a number of the hubs. So there's CC Hub, there's Renovation Hub, there's Idea, there's Inspire. I work with all of those. Okay. You know, um, so that's looking at those who are under incubation. I'm also increasingly working with Angel Networks, so the Lagos Angel Network, um, the King's College Lions Den, and I've been approached by another couple of um, interested uh, Angel Networks, so working through those to sort of do the seeding. Um, then you have the foundations like the Alumelu Foundation, um, the um, Danjuma Foundation, and others who, again, are coming from the funding standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, I also work with um, 
the ecosystem groups. So Mobile Monday, okay, for example, looks specifically at the mobile ecosystem and mobile technology, and that brings the mobile network operators and the developer community. I mean, I think Mobile Monday's got something like 700 developers on its books. Wow. So working with those groups is how, you know, I tend to operate right now. Does your relationship tend to be more virtual or are there physical communities where you gather? How does it work? Oh yeah, it's a combination of both. Um, we have very, very active, I mean, I'm active on Twitter, I'm active on Facebook, all the usual, you name it, you know. Um, you'll probably find my fingerprints, you know, <laughs> digital fingerprints that is on them. Um, but also, Mobile Monday meets every last Monday of the month. Um, CC Hub has uh, different uh, presentation days. The Angel Network has pitch days, etc., etc. So it's, it's a combination of physical and virtual. What do you think are the key frustrations for these techpreneurs today? Ooh. Um, the key frustration, you will hear from them money, money, money. Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, as a major, I having interacted with them now for the last couple of years, believe that mentoring is probably a bigger challenge than mm. it as than is funding. Mm. You know. Hence your role as an incubator basically. Yes. Mm. Um, we need more role models yeah. that can mentor. Those who are familiar with technology mm. and have sort of been there, done that, got the T shirt kind of people. So one of the things I'm be looking to people like yourself for is to find a way for us to reach out to diasporans who've been successful in technology mm. and see how we can create through, you know, uh, things like this, an avenue yes. to Absolutely. expose, you know, our young entrepreneurs to, these to you know, to mm. Nigerians and Africans who are, have been successful being entrepreneurs in the West. Mm. Interesting. Why are you doing this? <laughs> mm. Oh, that's a very personal question. <laughs> <laughs> you can I'm give doing us a this. Secret, yes. Why am I doing this? I am doing this um, because I was privileged, okay, to have been exposed very early uh, to technology. I remember having an HP calculator in secondary school and taking it apart and. Uh, you know, sort of trying to figure out why I had this uh, breadboard. And, you know, I remember my first soldering iron. I remember reading an oscilloscope. And um, sort of those were my toys when people were busy with other types of toys. And um, I haven't done too badly in terms of having been privileged to work in the West with the likes of Marks and Spencer, IBM, Elf Aquitaine, Elf S, Ernst & Young, and so on. So I reckon, you know, it's time to sort of... Give back. Give back. Mm. You know, I stood on, as they say, the shoulder of giants. Um, maybe just one or two can stand on mine. Well done. Excellent work, yeah. I must say. Thank you very much. What does the future hold for technology in Africa? Ooh, I think it's quite exciting. Um, I believe that given the youthful population, um, the kind of dynamics we're going to start to see with uh, the rise, unfortunately, I don't like it, but it's the reality in individuality. Mm. Okay, so we're seeing a slow march to death of the family, much as we do not. I mean, I, I abhor it and I look and I'm, you know, but I, I can see that. Uh, what that means is we're going to be designing and devising mechanisms for a new lifestyle. Mm. Um, the increase in an understanding that if we don't do things, we're going to kill the planet is going to lead us to more environmental friendly solutions. So that again presents a fantastic set of opportunities, mm. you know, uh, for the future. So when you look at those dynamics and you start to add them up, it means housing is going to change. The nature of food and agriculture is going to change. We've already talked about health, okay? But most fundamentally, it also means what I call learning on demand. Mm. You know, so the nature of education itself is, uh, is going to change. If you add all of those together, boy, you know, I wish I could live for 200 years. <laughs>
Interesting. We've been listening to Mr. Tommy Davis sharing his own insight and his perspectives on incubating the touch screen generation with particular emphasis on the techpreneurs, the emerging techpreneurs in Africa. He's given us um, essentially a picture of boundaryless opportunities for the African youth who will understand the phenomenon and who will tap into it. Um, the challenges that we face, be it in education or in health or in agriculture, are developmental challenges indeed pose for us on the flip side immense op opportunities. So, a picture of hope, I would say. Thank you for joining us. I want to thank our, our guest You're welcome. for thank finding you. time to be with us. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to meeting with you again. God bless you.